Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm I'm from Edinburgh University. We've done the MOOC thing for what feels like forever, but uh, it's been just short of a eighteen month <laughs> period now, but live of just under a year. Um, so um, I know that because we're we're maybe in a slightly different stage, where we've kind of got different layers of, of courses and things going on. That if at any point I'm saying something you'd like more information about, or if you've got a question as we go along, very very happy to take shout outs and hands up or whatever. Um, this isn't a lecture uh, of any means. This is more of a kind of a discussion because we still have a lot to learn um, from everybody else as well. So your questions are uh, really useful for us. Um, so just kind of putting it a little bit in context to start, um, we. We have uh, we had six courses go live um, this year in January. Um, we've just announced um, a further a further course on, on future. So we started off with um, Coursera, and we've now just launched um, a partnership with FutureLearn as well. Um, and we've got uh, and a further six courses have been announced on Coursera, with about um, ten or so in development behind the scenes on top of that. So um, it's it's busy. Um, it's exciting and. Um, our subject areas are very broad. Um, we started off um, with our, our first six courses were um, uh, two courses from each of our colleges at the university. So we had two from medicine, veterinary medicine, two from um, humanities, and two from um, science. Um, and we're kind of seeing that trend kind of continue. It's very much a, um, an even piece across the, the board. Academics are coming from far and wide to be part of things. Uh, enthusiasm is still very high. Um, one thing that we've uh, we've always been keen to, to ensure is that all of our courses are short. These are by no means um, just taking what we've we've done online. or taking the on-campus experience, videoing it, putting it online. These are um, purpose-made for MOOC uh, experiences rather than for um, taking over what we, we're already doing. So very similar to how many of the other um, presenters uh, so far have kind of said is. They've been developing new courses, um, so it was a real opportunity to be saying, well, what do we want to do in this space? And let's get excited about uh, learning and teaching again and, uh, and see what we can do and, and challenge things, do things a little bit differently. Um, we were obviously fully online, um, free to take, um, but uh, something I'll um, talk about a little bit later is kind of open resources. If not only were we taking kind of um, taking a steer that we should be you know, doing good practicing where um, there are resources already out there in the web and um, using Creative Commons wherever we possibly can because it makes it easier for sharing. But actually the most exciting thing is everything we do, wherever we can give um, a license for it, we make Creative Commons. So we're really keen for others to be using the content in, in different ways, to be repurposing it, recycling it, etc. And, and just without stifling the innovation as much as we can, say so put it out into the, the world and see what happens. Um, and if we put too many licenses and kind of barriers over that, then it kind of stifle some of the things that can potentially happen. Um, and uh, yeah, just at the bottom was just kind of a quick summary of uh, our, our scheduling, how long it took to go from start to finish on the Coursera um, initiative. And actually, it was very similar for FutureLearn as well. Um, so again, just to kind of uh, give you a little bit of background on some of our, our subject areas, this was our first six, um, so pretty broad. Then we launched the Higgs boson with uh, FutureLearn, and then we launched a further six with Coursera. Um, but I can give you more details if anyone has any questions about that. So yeah, why why did we do this? Um, it it's funny because we hear quite often, especially um, across the piece, about this being about making my return on investment, having you know, marketing or whatever. Yes, marketing is important. Yes, it is brand awareness. But actually, this is this is research and development. This is bread and butter for institutions. Um, you know, it gives us an opportunity to be exploring new spaces, challenging um, how we're, we're teaching and learning, but also to to say, well, this is a research project in itself. It yields data. There's uh, learning analytics that we could be looking at. There's you know the way that people are using content is going to change because we're, we're we're just putting it out there and saying, what happens if um, trailing dots and then um, trying to measure the impact in whatever means that could be and actually realizing that this isn't something that we're very used to we're not used to kind of saying here's here's an unknown entity and engage with it in an unknown way and then let's try and deal with that on the other side we're used to saying here's a defined course and you sign up to that course and if you do not complete the course then you are you are a dropout or you are a failure in some respects and this is flipping that it on its head and saying you could be coming in with 
any, any reason whatsoever, that's really exciting and we're really keen to have a look at that um, and to, to, you know, work with you and try, trying to, to ensure that you get the, the experience out of it that you wish to um, sign up for rather than something that we have prescribed onto you. Um, yes, there's obviously the universe strength, but we also feel this is really good fun. Um, and uh, and it still is a lot of, of, of huge fun, even though it's uh, yeah, it's a bit taxing. It can it can be exhausting, but uh, it's it's worth it. It's been incredible, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But we also knew it was never going to make us money. Um, yes, we can get some return on it, and there are some things that we could be doing, but that's not the point of it. And also, we we were never expecting to be suddenly break even um, because, well there's a little bit of investment up front that's needed in order to get these things going and uh, we're keen as well for the schools to be reinvesting any, in, uh, any revenue that comes from the course, say for example on um, uh, assessments or certificates and things to be reinvested directly back into the, the courses themselves, so either developing new content or investment in teaching assistance etc. So it's not about making back to the centre, it's about developing those courses further um, in ways that uh, people respond to and, and just Again, saying, what, what can we do if we invest in these things in different ways and let them grow and nurture them in, in uh, different ways, I guess. Um, so how did we do it? Well, um, to begin with, we, uh, uh, we didn't impose a template. Uh, it was asking academics to come to us and say, well, what would you like to do? You've got this blank canvas. How would you like to develop it? Um, and we ended up with six very different courses. Um, and and it was, it was wonderful actually to see how each academic was viewing it in different ways. Each team brought their own personality. Um, and it's something that we're continuing um, on throughout our, our new phases as well. So although on, on one side uh, it would be a lot easier um, to say we're, this is the Edinburgh approach to MOOCs and everybody has to do it in the same way and you're only given this amount of time in front of the camera, so on and so forth, and good for scheduling. In many ways, that was, that goes against the ethos of us saying, what do you want this space to be, and, and let's, let's try and work it out. Get us excited about your course and make us want to put something a little bit different into it um, and, uh, and respond to it accordingly with the different um, uh, uh, kind of resources that we can, we can put in. Um, we were also keen for them to be experimenting. Um, so when we said it's a blank canvas, we said, you know, you've got this framework, and, and that's great. And you can do that, but you could also break it. If you want to do something different, try it. Give it a go. This is a, it's, it's, it's funny how, um, how having something that's so big and so open and, and so visible to the world seemed to be a less risky space to experiment in. Um, whereas uh, doing things on campus for credit seemed to have a lot more risks involved. So from, perhaps it was the, the nature of it being um, not credit bearing. Um, gave more flexibility for this. In fact, it was short and it wasn't connected to any of our, um, our normal activities, that it, it felt l less, uh, less of a risk to, to try something out, something new that perhaps people have been um, thinking about for a while but hadn't necessarily had the, uh, the space to develop further. Um, and as I said already, uh, we were keen for people to be using content that was sitting in other places, to signpost to other things, to um, to essentially do what we hope to see in the future of people reusing our content, so we reuse other content and see see what's sitting around. But most of us are sitting on huge archives in um, university libraries and and, and uh, uh, digital media and things that people don't see. And unless we have a way of surfacing it, and this is uh, MOOCs are a, an opportunity for us to do that to say look, there's this space, and actually the university is starting to to kind of join together and go around to each of the individual departments and say, look, you've got this great resource and we'd really like to use it. And they go, oh, that's fantastic, can we put it in? Obviously, we have to be concerned about um, uh, licenses and things, but wherever we can, um, it seems that people are really keen to be um, using this as an opportunity to hook their, their area, their discipline, their uh, department onto um, the courses that are coming through. So. A, a quick kind of uh, summary on, on one of our MOOCs, uh, the EDC MOOC that you may be um, aware of, Elan Digital Cultures, they, um, they were a little bit different um, to the standard MOOC space in that um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like the, 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 the traditional MOOC um, of um, having things all sitting within the core site. They put it 
So find your own spaces, talk about it wherever you wish to talk about it, um, and bring it back into an aggregated hashtag feed. Um, and then the academics reflect on what's the conversations that are happening across the, the community. It's more of a connectivist approach, um, rather than saying, we have prescribed tasks for you um, that you must, activities that you must engage with at particular times. There was content that was seeded and then people went off and nurtured it in their own ways and then brought it back to um, talking to the community. Also, it was quite nice that it, it ran in parallel with um, one of our um, on camp, uh, one of our mm. online but for credit um, MSc programs, um, the MSc in Digital Education, um, which uh, had its participants, so its students on that course were also participating in the MOOC as teaching assistants. So it was quite a nice um, community effort as well, um, getting more people involved and trying to kind of um, encourage others to, uh, to engage in different ways. Um, another thing that, uh, that one of our, our groups uh, played around with, um, so a, in artificial intelligence planning, um, AI planning, they uh, took it out to uh, Second Life. So they did a, an, a synchronous session on Second Life that was then kind of uh, video captured and then put onto um, their MOOC space later. Again, another opportunity to kind of get the community to talk. So we had people doing things that were a little bit different, going into other spaces wherever we could, but we also had some very traditional, like, in, uh, introduction to philosophy, um, took a very, um, we have lectures and then parallel activities and questions um, at the end of each week, and um, <coughs> so we had the spectrum wherever we, we could. Uh, okay, great. Um, Overall, in the first wave, we had 310,000 um, enrollees on our courses. Um, now we're in the, the next stage, and we obviously we haven't um, done as much marketing this time because it's it's not as you we're still um, waiting to do that next push. But we've we've now got um, around 410,000 people enrolled on um, our courses. So 310, the first wave added on another 100,000 or so um, who are currently enrolled on um, our 13 courses in total. Um, the widest range of um, backgrounds as well, and I, I can go into more details uh, later if people are interested, but uh, it's most, uh, much of what everyone else has been saying is that it's almost across the entire piece of countries, um, wide age ranges, um, diverse intentions, everyone came with a, um, a different reason for being there. They had um, different backgrounds, and that in itself was very rich and came out through the, um, the forum discussions. Um, but what was most interesting, we said, um, you know, going back to the, the title of this being it's kind of beyond the hype, MOOCs didn't really, they didn't just bubble up from absolutely nowhere, you know, we've been doing, many, many people in this room are from institutions that have been doing online education for <laughs> many, many years, um, and, uh, and so it's not, it's not actually that new, the, the stuff that, um, that the, the kind of like the, the, the nuggets of learning engagement are very similar, if not identical, to what we've been doing before, just in a slightly different virtual learning environment. Um, obviously, there are differences, it's mainly the scale that's, that's uh, different to what we've done before, but the kind of um, the broad underlines um, are, let me say, what are mixed made of? Um, so, typical features there's a virtual learning environment, there's some videos sometimes, interactive tools. Uh, discussion forums, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, rush ahead. But anyway, um, it, uh, it it wasn't really anything new, but it is something that uh, is enriching to that overall experience. Um, what, however, has been very different is the way that the content is being used. So, usually, courses sit behind. Um, Files or, or shibboleths or whatever that you can't see what's going on behind it. You can't be reusing it. You can't be sharing it in ways. Whereas MOOCs do provide an opportunity for us to say, well, here's some stuff, and it's open to people. And, and how can we be using it in different ways um, and uh, be informing developments within the institution or out with the institution? So here are just a, a few examples of what we've got going on at the moment with our first um, six courses. Um, on campus, we have um, some of the, uh, the learning materials, some of the, the videos are being used for on-campus activities, um, but that's just kind of to, to en enrich at the moment. It's by no means a signpost them over and uh, then say come back in five weeks' time. It's a uh, um, embedding the videos in, in different ways on the virtual learning environment. 
Um, the data sets themselves, so um, the, each of the, the MOOCs have learning analytics where you can trace the individual learners, that, that's a huge amount of data that's being um, kind of created. Um, and those data sets are of, of real interest to um, academics across the institution for um, MSc dissertations, etc., um, to get their students to be engaging with research of, of big data sets, big, you know, data mining that perhaps we haven't necessarily had um, uh, access to before as readily as well. Every time we, we launch these courses, we will be creating another data set that could be used within that mix. And also, by them being part of that conversation means that um, we then have a greater understanding of what's going on because they're, they're exploring things we wouldn't necessarily be able to um, explore on, on our own if we're doing um, research activities ourselves. Um, we're also seeing that um, people are starting to signpost their students to um, other people's moves. So just for, again, uh, the enriching um, experience saying, well, there's this content sitting over there with, with Harvard you might be interested in, or there's um, another course that's coming up that you might want to enroll on that uh, complements this, uh, this course well. Um, but some of the most interesting stuff is happening off campus. Um, so our, um, our content is currently being used um, in, in many different ways internationally. Um, so for example, the University of Maryland have taken um, a, a copy of um, critical thinking and a copy of introduction to philosophy and are using that for credit bearing activities. So they've um, taken a version and they, they've tweaked it for their, their um, own delivery and then they've assigned credit to, um, to that for the university state system. Um, and we've also shared our content with um, a academic project called uh, Generation Rwanda and uh, they've taken um, again um, similar courses, they've taken copies of them and are delivering them within um, secondary edu education within Rwanda to see what, what works, how does it work, whether um, uh, students enjoy that experience, whether it's, it's something that they would like to explore and that's a conversation I need to pick up um, probably when I get back to the office uh, tomorrow is uh, is where that's going because they did a pilot and it was very well received but uh, we're now saying well you can use all of our content if you want it but uh, um, but let's not just kind of say here's, here's some stuff we would really like to know what you're doing with it and how we can be developing things that may be you know mutually beneficial of us kind of then also gaining, like, gaining insight into um, how our content is being used because that in itself is a research initiative. Um, on top of that, um, we have local schools within Edinburgh have been using our content. Um, we've had uh, one, one example within um, Introduction to Philosophy where there was a teacher that enrolled onto the, the platform and then taught with the class. Um, I think it was a, um, an extracurricular activity, um, but they, they did the course together. Um, so there was a, an after school where they, they sat down with kind of as, as a, a group based discussion, which was lovely, um, and something else that we, we really want to be. Um, Hearing more about what that's another opportunity for us to pick up in the, the new year um, is how do we best engage with schools? Because it's all well and good saying there's this content there, um, but not, not every school is going to have um, uh, strong enough <coughs> internet connections to get everyone to be simultaneously accessing it potentially, or to have enough bits of kit, or to have, um, you know, we, we might want to do it by CD, you might go old school um, and send them out uh, packages in the <coughs> post, or, you know, there's, there's things that we could be doing, um, but uh, again, there's no point us going in and saying, here's, here's <coughs> our content, here you go. Instead, it's a conversation of, we have some content, but how would, how would it be best given to you? Would you prefer it online and it's, and it's successful and we can share it, or would you prefer it in um, a, a hard copy form, or, would, you know, it's, again, it's about discussions and not assuming that you know the best way to be engaging with these new audiences. Instead, saying, let's, let's start building a, a little bit of a discussion together. Um, the nice thing we're seeing on, um, Future, uh, on um, Coursera is that all of our videos are uh, being translated into other languages. And there are a couple of initiatives that are going on um, through Coursera to um, outreach in um, uh, South America. Is Portuguese and Spanish is being... Um, uh, kind of put onto some of the, the, the very high, uh, not high recruiting, but um, high enrollee uh, courses. Um, and uh, critical thinking and philosophy, again, have both been um, fully translated into Portuguese and um, Spanish um, and are being used for 
uh, outreach initiatives there, which is, is great. And um, finally, um, all, of the, all of the courses on Coursera are being um, streamed on a parallel server for um, Chinese engagement. Um, so usually there's, there's a number of um, blocks that are um, yes, present for um, people trying to access from a Chinese um, IP onto some of the um, data we have um, on the internet because of um, local uh, firewalls and such. And so by having parallel servers and, and streaming systems, it means that people can be engaging with it over that, um, uh, well, those usual barriers, um, which is, is interesting we, we, because China is, um, is a, an area that there's, there's a lot of potential, but we're not necessarily um, engaging with um, as well as, uh, as people think. You know, we have on campus markets for um, our MSc programs, for example, that when it's put online, the, the same demographic is replicated all bar China. Um, and, and that's really interesting in itself of um, what are the online barriers. And again, it's a, a, a conversation, a research project in itself to start asking, are we doing things differently? Is there something that we could, um, we could learn from this experience that um, maybe it's not necessarily that our, our content is, um, is not fit for purpose, but maybe it's sitting in the wrong place, um, or maybe it's not being serviced, or maybe it's not fit for purpose, maybe, we, maybe we're, we're pitching it wrong, but we don't know, we just have to ask. Um, but it's also far more than just building the courses. Um, what we're seeing is that um, academics are, and, and the internal community are starting to, to look at, um, and, at this, this online movement and go, oh, I want to be part of that. I want to do a MOOC. Or I want to be kind of doing some online activities. Or maybe I could start reflecting on my on-campus activities to involve more um, interactions, more online discussions, more synchronous, asynchronous activities. And, and, and it's not by any means an overnight change, but it, it's, it's, get, it's getting there. The momentum is, is building, and that's really exciting to see that, that we're start, we are seeing a step change um, at, at Edinburgh, people wanting to, to, to engage um, in conversations that we, we thought you know, the door was shut to. People are now going, oh, actually, I think, I think we're ready now. I think we're ready to start talking about online learning, which is fantastic. Um, and if nothing else, something that uh, we should be um, building more on. Um, one nice example of this is, uh, in, is philosophy, again, um, this was a, a, a school that actually had uh, not done any online learning at all, um, and we threw them right in at the deep end with the MOOCs, uh, in that uh, the head of school was keen, and uh, there was a team identified, and they wanted to do something, but they knew it, it was scary for them, but they thought, oh, blast, we've only got one shot, let's, let's give it a go. And they loved it so much that they're now doing a fully online MSc program and they're doing more online activities with their on-campus students and their outreach in schools. They've got book um, and research uh, uh, collaborations that have been um, established as a result of being in this online space that um, they, well, they've never been in. And actually they've now become, uh, I think, the, the first fully online philosophy program in, uh, it might be in the UK, but... Uh, uh, yeah, there's, they're one of the first in something, and that makes me feel good about stuff. Um, but uh, that's no bad thing. Um, the fact that we're, we're saying there is no subject that you, you can't put online, give us a challenge and let's, let's, let's do it, let's think about it in different ways, is, um, is exciting to see. Um, we're, we have a, a strategy at the university for getting um, a fully online MSc program in every school. Um, and we're not doing too badly, but there are some schools that haven't crossed that line yet. And we're really keen to know why. And as I, I alluded to a minute ago, it's predominantly because they just weren't ready at the time that other schools were ready. And um, some are stepping into the MOOC space um, <coughs> as, a, as a testing the ground before they go into um, MSc provision. And, and some are almost saying, well, others can do the MOOCs thing. And that doesn't look too scary. Or they're doing online learning. OK, maybe I could do that too. And we are, we are seeing. And set changes of people starting to ask some of those questions, which is great. Um, and what we're also seeing at the moment is um, a, a space for collaboration. Um, so with many of our courses, yes, we, we do have interdisciplinary um, online courses, um, but what the, the MOOCs provide is a, is a, a platform that it's, it's quite easy, actually, to do collaborations. Schools can get together and say, let's do something that sits in the middle. We've got many schools who are all collaborating and, and saying, let's do this one week that makes sense for us. Um, 
and that isn't something that they've necessarily felt that there was the agility to engage with before. Um, so plans for the future for Edinburgh um, is that we're we're looking for more outreach. We're thinking about um, community provisions, looking to youth groups and schools and such to say how how would you like us to engage? Hey, we've got this stuff. Is it of use to you? But also we can see that there's a potential connection here. Can we can we start a conversation? Um, and also getting our students to see that uh, it's something that we acknowledge and we recognise and we'd quite like if they would like it to be on their transcript then we can facilitate that. Um, and trying to find a flexible portfolio approach to these things is um, potentially very, very nice. Um, but working with um, local needs as well, local and national needs to say, well, is there a particular route that Scotland needs, a particular gap that the UK could be filling with a MOOC of some description, and that's not necessarily for just Edinburgh, that's that's for everyone that's kind of in the, the MOOC domain, as it were, for us to, to say, well, we've got this opportunity here, um, let's, again, let's collaborate. Um, so, moving out of the Edinburgh space and into kind of more of a, a national sphere, um, we, we've seen that, obviously, MOOCs have had a lot of impact, but how much impact have they actually had? Well, we've seen it's had quite a lot of impact with university uh, provosts and, and uh, vice chancellors, etc. Um, it's, it's definitely infused them with online learning that perhaps we haven't seen at a at the same level before. Um, governments are talking about online learning and um, wanting to develop new courses, which is pretty exciting. Um, and the media love it. Oh, the, the, if you can talk about a course having 200,000 people on it, oh, wow, they could not get enough of it. Well, <laughs> in some respects you can go, oh, but it's not all about that. But in other ways, again, that's, that's high level BBC media is a pretty, you know, almost every week there's something about online learning. And that's incredible. Um, that's a domain that we've not been in before. And I'm um, really interested in you saying, no, that's not the point. Yeah, exactly. But, so you just yeah, but, that, but that's all right. If it's getting into mass media and there are people that are looking at these things that perhaps wouldn't have ever thought about it before, wouldn't have thought that there would be an online course for free and branding, well, why not? Um, and, and, and although, you know, in some respects it's had a big impact, it's also probably had more of an impact in the spaces that we're looking in. So the next thing is getting, getting the media out there for, you know, outreach to community groups that haven't necessarily had the engagement. We can see there's lots lots coming through Guardian Education, lots happening in BBC Education, um, but we don't necessarily see quite as much yet in local newspapers, but maybe we will see more and maybe they'll get excited about it. Um, but what is interesting is um, the, the kind of like the, the loop, um, the connection on um, media and uh, the impact that's having on students and as we've seen that, uh, that many people are, are seeing that their students are engaging with um, the, the MOOC activities and are keen to, to do more of it and to, are starting to kind of, but, well, you're doing this thing over there and that's really fun, why is it not coming over here? They're kind of the, they are becoming more vocal and more empowered to, to kind of speed up and accelerate that, that rate of change that we see within the, um, uh, the on-campus and the online classroom to say well, there, there's things happening that we could be doing or well, maybe that we need to start having an internal reflection and um, kind of development on um, our learning provisions. Um, but also what's, uh, what's most uh, noticeable is that there's been most impact in the areas that we would expect where the advertising has been happening of the US, the UK, Australia, etc. Um, and, and the regions do vary and I, I think that's where you know, the, the future plans are to make sure that we, we are starting to outreach and get you know, your, your point earlier around Internet is a is a limiting factor here. You know, not everyone has fast. You know, has broadband access. That's always going to be a, a difficulty for streaming videos. Um, <coughs> and, and so we do need to start. Thinking, well, this has been a fantastic opportunity. We've seen a lot of impact. But if we're going to really take it to the next level, we we do need to start thinking critically of how how does it make greatest impact? How do we start out? You know, reaching to those um, uh, to areas that we we hope by teaching the world, um, we could teach the world, but you can only do that when um, uh, everybody has access. Um, I think that's pretty much me done. Obviously, what, just quickly, I'll finish on this. 
you know, we've got at the moment over five million people are talking about online learning. And if that's not an opportunity for us to be capitalising on, if we, that's not something, if we've got all these institutions, we're talking about online learning, we've got the, hundreds, hundreds and thousands of academics that are involved in this stuff. I think we, you know, the, the topic of this, uh, this whole conference is, you know, should we turn back? Well, why would we turn our back on that? Surely we just need to keep running with it and seeing what happens next. But I've, I've got other bits, but I'll stop there. Stop and uh, yes. questions. I wonder if we could just take a few questions for Amy now. We do have the panel later on while we're setting up for the online connection. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, Thanks for that. From your experience so far with Cassiera, um, this sharing of experimentation, um, is everybody sharing? I mean, it could be seen as quite a competitive advantage to know how to do things well. I mean, is, is, is the approach of Cassiera to, to share all this analytics, is approaching all the, all the participants in different universities to share it, or, or is it seen as competitive? Um. So there's, there's a lot to be said for um, doing what you wish to see. So everything that we're doing is being shared. Um, it's our content, Creative Commons, but um, all the research that we're doing, all the scripts that we're, um, we're developing, they will be Creative Commons Open Access. Um, all of our, our materials, that all our handbooks, for example, that we give to our academic staff, they're all Creative Commons. They're freely open to anyone. We're hopefully going to be developing a future learn version of that as well, which we will be circulating to the masses. Our reports are open access. We, everything we do, we're trying to share. And we are starting to see noticeable changes. Because actually, what's quite nice is if you, you, you do something, you share it, you say, it's not finished, it's not perfect. Tweak it, do, do what I want, let's, but let's learn from this process. Um, you know, we've seen our, our surveys have been used now. That's the, the European standard um, for um, the, the first kind of um, questionnaires that are given within Coursera. Now, that's great because it makes it really easy for us to then share and compare um, data sets. Um, if we know that there's a commonality within the question sets that are being asked at the beginning and the demographics that are being taken. Um, we are seeing, especially within Europe, uh, there's a, a real enthusiasm to be doing this, but not everybody has something to share yet. Many of the partners are still very new. Um, so we're trying to do a bit of a, put something out there first and hopefully others will, will join in. Um, but if they don't, well, then that's why hopefully they found some of the stuff we put out useful and if they didn't, well, that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, at least we tried. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it would be great to see more people sharing. We'd love to see it happening. People are keen to share, um, but uh, I don't think that's necessarily Coursera because Coursera are doing a lot to nurture that, uh, uh, that development. But um, it's not necessarily their place, so you must share it. So it, it kind of has to happen no, in the I institutions. Yeah. Talk by Casera, who's saying uh, they've got more data and more knowledge about learning um, from, their, from mm -hmm. their platform than the rest of humanity put together. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably have that they are very, they are very open-minded things. If you ask them for um, information, they they do share within the partnership, mm -hmm. and then we share the outcomes of, of that analysis, for example. So we we are trying as much as we can to do it. And yeah, they're good guys. Um, likewise with uh, all the MOOC platforms. Everyone has it. They're in, they've got their best interests at heart, let's say. Mm -hmm. so. Would you have time for that one? Yeah. yeah. Another question. Any other questions? Hi, just a, a detail. Um, I love the, the way that you're making it with the open. Uh, there was a clause in Coursera, I wonder if it's changed to say that all posts and all resources posted by learners are the property of Coursera, or the copyright of Coursera exclusively. Has that changed? Um, so there's, there's a big difference between the content that's created that's then populated within Coursera and that Coursera instance. So um, Coursera do not own any of the copyright of materials that are developed by the uh, institution. The institution holds for life oh, easier. Right. Right. But, but the... But the uh, information that's put into forum discussions and things, because they sit on Coursera's instance on the, um, the platform, then Coursera, you could say own, but it's it, it's really it's just in that they have they, they sit on that data and they they hold that data. It, I don't think it's changed, but they also have no um, rights over the content that's that's put on. Um, so they, they have access to a version 
of our um, materials that are uploaded to the Coursera platform for the intention of that particular course, but we can pull it at any time. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it, it depends what, so people don't have to write anything on the forums if they don't want to. Um, I, I guess it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I don't, I don't think that uh, the, I haven't heard any, any grumblings of it and it's something that um, lots of people are engaging with and don't seem to have a problem with at the moment. Um, maybe, maybe we'll see something in the future, but hopefully not. Hopefully everyone's doing this for the right reasons and uh, um, not necessarily feeling too, too bad about sharing and asking questions and things on the forums for IP implications or whatever, I'm not sure. We'll see, I guess. <laughs> it's an experiment. Um, any more questions? I was just going to follow that up. Might be heavy. Um, <laughs> I was just going to follow that up by a question. If, supposing you took a screenshot of a, a, a forum post or a set of forum posts, etc., and you wanted to use that in a, an academic publication, would you need to actually um, ask permission? If, if you're taking a screenshot, yes, only because you would then be able to trace the individual if you found them on uh, the Coursera So you could anonymise all of the, the... Yes, the, yeah, and so you can you can definitely use um, uh, the data within the the, the platform itself um, for uh, research uh, potential. There's no there's no bars there. It just needs to be anonymised. Um, taking a, a, a screenshot, um, if it's... Traceable back to that individual learner is. Um, and not to the best of my knowledge, um, but that's also because it, it advances them for them to have us doing research and things. So I think there's there's a, a fine line that that uh, seems to be working in everyone's best interest at the moment. But we'll see. Thank you. We're still waiting for our connection in America, so. <laughs> Are there any more questions? How, how do you license your materials, the materials you use? Because you said uh, they are being used in other places. So are they open license? They can change them to make them related to the contents and uh, use them anyhow they want? Uh, so all, all of our contents are their watermark, um, but they are open access and they are, um, um, well, we use Creative Commons images wherever we can, if we can't find it there, then it, so everything we, we do can be shared and can be then repurposed wherever possible. Um, if, it, if it has a, if we've used a particular image that has a license associated to it, that we've bought that particular image for that particular instance, when we share it, we would make it clear that that particular image would need to have a new license bought for it if it was being used in a particular way. So um, there's, it's not quite as, as simple as, here's, here's a full kind of copy of it, but we have in each of our courses a copyright section that kind of gives traces of each of the individual um, resources that are used and, and what their license means and how we can use it, etc. So um, hopefully it's, uh, it's as clear as it can be for um, sharing and repurposing later. But uh, we haven't heard any, mainly because the instances that have been taken for further use and development have been for educational private purpose rather than for MOOC sphere use. Um, it's not uh, then taking, Maryland haven't taken a version and then said, oh, this is the Maryland version of um, the Edinburgh MOOC being used like a MOOC. It's being used as a private course. And there are certain affordances that come with doing um, education behind close you know most people use images that uh, if it were open uh, they probably would be able to just take something from Google um, on their slides for um, a private uh, um, cohort of students for example but we do get away with a lot in um, education because it's being used for those particular um, reasons rather than it being kind of an open space um, whereas the minute you put it out to the world and say here's our content you kind of need to make sure that you've got a trace for everything that uh, is being used there's a question. Hi, Amy, Matt from UCL. Uh, what's the reaction been from your student body in terms of, do you know any students at Edinburgh doing any of your MOOCs? Uh, or indeed, have they been incorporated into any programs on an official level? 
Um, so we, we actually haven't heard any any grammy. Everything that we've heard has been um, positive, but that's also because we haven't um, we haven't done the whole integration into a uh, formally integration into our um, our provisions. It's been more of a oh, there's some nice videos over there, or there's a good course over there. Um, we also have been very very clear that we have our MOOCs learners that sit on this this platform over there, and if you are you could be a student of us and happen to be a learner of the MOOC, but you are by no means a student with us if you do the MOOC. So we've been keeping them very, very clear in every every kind of document or whatever that goes out, it's always kind of students are the ones that go through our formal um, uh, kind of enrollment processes and uh, learners are people that sit on different servers by Coursera or FutureLearn or whatever, keeping a bit of an arm's So I think because of that, we probably haven't, we've, we've forgotten some of the, um, uh, I guess ambiguity that comes with others talking about students collectively, or kind of students, or, or um, students maybe seeing uh, more of that merging agenda. Um, just maybe because we haven't explored it as much yet. But um, I guess watch the space. Um, so some, I know some institutions have had more problems with that than others, but we haven't seen it yet. Anyway, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.